Okay, good evening and thank you for all joining us tonight. Uh, please note we are recording this program and I'll post it on our YouTube channel later this week. My name is Christina Culp and I'm the director of MARSH. We are a chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation in the Marvin area of Union County and we're focused on the 28173 zip code. Our mission is to engage our community and educate them about the benefits of restoring and protecting wildlife habitats. If you are a member of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation or become one in the future, you can select Marsh as the donor chapter affiliate and our group will receive half of your membership fee. That money allows us to continue providing great presentations like the one we're doing tonight. And also, if you would like to consider joining Marsh, the Marsh Planning Group, we are always looking for new members. And our main focus of the Marsh Planning Group is to provide educational opportunities for our community. And not just with presentations, but as COVID restrictions get lifted, hopefully we'll be able to do some in-person things, um, which would be really a nice change of pace, wouldn't it? Um, and with a larger you know, planning group, we can do a lot more events. If you're interested, you can send me a note in the chat or an email at marshforwildlife at gmail.com. And I'll put that in the, um, the chat box for you. Um, and before I introduce tonight's guest, I would like to remind you about next month's speaker. Um, on May the 25th at 6.30, Rupert Medford will be back with us. He was, I think, the second speaker we had when we first started our speaker series uh, in 2019. And he spoke to us about coyotes the first time he was here. And we had, I think we had 80 people at, over at the Presbyterian Church to talk about coyotes. I think it was 25 degrees that night. Um, but we all showed up to talk about coyotes and it was a great presentation. So since our last four, including this one, our first four uh, presentations for 2021 20, uh, have been about how to get wildlife to come to your yard, we thought maybe our fifth presentation ought to be, okay, now they've all shown up. What am I gonna do with the ones that are a little bit more destructive? And how am I gonna manage those? I think is a nice way to put it. And um, he's also promised to talk to us a little bit more about coyotes again, because that's always a big topic on next door. If you look at that, copperheads and coyotes. Those are the two big things. Yeah. So on to tonight's presentation. Maybe that's a presentation for the future, right? <laughs> copperheads and coyotes. Um, on to tonight's presentation. It's all about pollinators. And our speaker tonight is Annie Howell. She has been a Union County Master Gardener for more than 10 years. There she is. And she's in charge of our Master Gardener Sales Committee and, a, and our Vice President. But one of her passions is insects. And I don't guess that lots of people can say that and really mean it, but I know that you really mean it. So tonight she's gonna to share her vast knowledge about plants and insects and how to attract those pollinators to your yard. Um, please add your questions to the chat box and we'll cover those at, toward the end of the presentation. Please mute your line while the presentation is in progress and thank you for joining us. Annie, you're up. Hi, uh, hi everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me and having me uh, as one of your speakers. And yes, it, it's not often, well, it hasn't been lately that I get to geek out about insects because we're, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do a lot of live presentations. So um, usually I do after school programs. I have a, a collection that I bring with me, and just the kids are either wowed or totally grossed out. So <laughs> this is more geared towards adults, but yeah, I am um, a self-proclaimed -pro insect geek. Um, it just, you know, it, I guess it started in college. I took an ecology class and one of the labs that we had to do, we actually went to a preserve and did insect collections. And then we had to preserve them, uh, dissect them and analyze them. So I guess it started there, but I would have to say that it really didn't get interesting until I moved down here. <laughs> um, being a transplant from New York, I swore when I moved down here that it was Jurassic Park because all of the insects were bigger, badder, meaner, and uglier. And uh, I actually started the insect collection that I now have that I bring to schools and other live presentations. Um, really just to educate myself and to educate my daughter who was little at the time. 
um, as to, you know, just because they're big, bigger than what we're normally used to, they're not necessarily all bad. Um, so that's how it, it really started was just really to educate ourselves and, and so forth, um, passing it forward. So there you go. Um, tonight's presentation, we could literally talk about this topic for days. I mean, there's just so much information and you could get really specific about certain things. Um, I do put a lot more specifics for butterflies and moths in this presentation, but basically everything that is in there for that can also uh, work for other pollinators as well, whether it be bees, wasps, Etc. So, you know, and again, it's really just realizing um, the scope of if you want to embrace gardening for pollinators, what you really need to brace yourself for, because it's, it sounds easy. And in a lot of ways it is, but you really do need to be prepared. And we'll go through some of the, the reasons why you need to just embrace the change that may happen if you do it right. So let's let's get going. Um, I'm going to flash a lot of slides that have a ton of helpful websites and links. It was really just easier to do that because, there, like I said, there's just so much information that if you go to any of these websites, you will wind up finding um, just a ton, whether it be what to plant, how to plant, integrated pest management, uh, specifically for our area here in the southeast, you know, if you're looking for just butterflies and moths, you know, what type of plants are you looking, where can you get them? I mean, there's just a ton of information. So these are some very helpful ones, uh, especially, especially if you're looking to, one, identify, like learn about some of the pollinators that will be coming to your garden. If you don't have many now and you start gardening for them, they will show up. So if you'd like to uh, do some identification. A lot of these websites will uh, be very, very helpful. Um, the Carolina Butterfly Society is a good one, Xerces as well, and um, Pollinator Partnership and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service down at the bottom. I would have to say of all of these websites, those two at the bottom are probably the most encompassing as far as information. I mean, they have, it's like one-stop shopping for everything plants, nurseries, who to go, how to do it, what's your planting plan, you know, what's, what should be your IPM, nesting boxes. I mean, they have everything in those two sites. So if you don't capture all of this, just remember uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and that's the government site, and pollinator.org, which is the Pollinator Partnership. And again, that's, they're really one-stop shopping. And I love websites that are like that, where you can just go to one, click on their links, and you can just get lost in there for hours because there's tons and tons of information. Um, so basically, if you're attending tonight, I'm guessing that you're interested in trying to garden for pollinators. And if your quest is to help them out as far as giving them somewhere to go and giving them a little slice of habitat in your backyard, I commend you because just even doing that little bit helps an awful lot. Um, and if, you'll, if you start to do some research and things like that, you'll often find that uh, there, websites refer to uh, pollinator deserts where there's no landscape, like partials, like, you know, lawns, they really provide absolutely no use to pollinators whatsoever. So there really are landscape deserts. And so even if you are the one neighbor, you know, if you get a couple of your neighbors that actually do some mindful planting for pollinators, that you will actually see a difference because you're giving them habitat in these potential uh, landscape deserts. And the reason, you know, why you might be doing it just to give you some ammunition, um, you know, you can read this and, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but basically pollinators are hardworking animals that help pollinate more than 75% of the world's flowering plants and nearly 75% of our food crops. So they do, it's, it's really unpaid labor and they do almost all the work. 
So the, what I loved is, this is from the Fish and Wildlife Service, is how they really try to catch people's attention by completely calling out chocolate and coffee as two of the crops that are high, you know, highly dependent on pollinators for you know, them to be a, benef you know, a, a harvestable crop. And I thought that was a great approach was to appeal to our, you know, personal human uh, needs as far as, you know, um, and, you know, addictions to coffee and, and chocolate. So I just thought that was awesome. Um, you know, why they're important, that's, that's a whole nother thing. I mean, not just only do they uh, pollinate the crops that a lot of, the, of what we eat, but if you think about the um, scope it says that one out of every three bites of food that we eat is there because of a pollinator of some sort or other, whether it be a bird, a bat, a bee, a butterfly, a moth. So that to me was just very profound as a reason is to really consider, you know, helping in even a very small way. And if you, you know, the quote here is if we talk dollars and cents, pollinators add $217 billion to the global economy. And honeybees alone are responsible for between $1.2 and $5.2 billion in agricultural productivity in the US alone, which is amazing. And is, if anybody's, you know, tuned in and, you've probably realized by now that the honeybee and the monarch butterfly are, have, and you know, forgive the analogy, have become the poster children for conservation and trying to help pollinators in general. So again, a lot of the tips that are in these websites and, and what I have for you here today apply to not only them, but to all pollinators in, in general. Okay, so if you want to really help, you have to kind of understand what the problem is and why there is such a huge decline in pollinator populations. And it's not where it's just a couple of percentages a year. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like 20, 30, 40% drops in some of the populations here, especially specifically in the United States and in certain areas. And the reason is, is because man is an first, enemy number one. The first quote that I made that I didn't use a pattern. Okay, so um, was that a question or was that somebody who didn't mute? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but it, man is the enemy number one. And if you see the picture in the upper right hand corner, I actually took that at the Science Museum and insects, you know, they, they did a like a life size bar graph of how different species make up the animal population on the planet. And insects is the largest chunk. There's 751,000 potential species. And they think, scientists think probably just that many more that have not been identified as of yet. Now, if you can see in the corner, all the way off to the left, the little purple block down there, yeah, that's mammals of which we are a part. And there's less than about 4,000 species on the planet. So it's just amazing to see how much they outnumber us but how much damage we do as such a small chunk of the, uh, of the actual animal population on the earth, but because of who we are and, the, and what we do, that we are such a detriment to their populations. And then the first and foremost is their loss of habitat. Conversions of you know um, woodlands and things to housing projects, you know putting in lawns, uh, you know non beneficial plantings, non native plantings, things that insects don't visit because they're cultivars that may be developed that don't have nectar or don't have a scent or are not attractive to insects at all. Um, so there's a lot of things that you need to be mindful of as you go forward and put together a planting plan if you are interested in really helping. The second most important is insect, insecticide, pesticide, and herbicide use. There is so much scientific data that indicates that even herbicides are very detrimental to a lot of the pollinators because of what the staying power of uh, herbicides, like on flowers, any insects that chew, that may eat leaves and things, they do not discriminate. So just remember, butterflies, moths, caterpillars are insects, as are other beneficials, lady beetles, native bees, predatory wasps, etc. Insecticides do not discriminate. 
If you choose to use them, use them wisely. It does not matter what the picture is on the bag. That's not just the insects that it targets. It is a pesticide and it will target all insects in that particular category. So for instance, if you're putting down a pesticide to target white grubs in your lawn, that's a beetle larva. So a lot of times it will also uh, attack other ground dwelling beetle larva that may be beneficial just so you don't get your white, your patch, your lawn, uh, you know, be patchy. You don't have to broadcast. You need to read the label and we'll go through being very specific in your integrated pest management and how you can reduce the amount to get the same results. Um, and remember, the label is the law. Always read the bag because if you don't put it down right, you're just throwing good money after bad and you might, you might not even be doing any good um, and you're potentially killing other things that you're not specifically targeting. I added street light and house lights because that's moths, moths are drawn to light, uh, bats, you know, things like that. They are very detrimental to insects. So if you can turn your lights off uh, at night on your house, that is definitely helpful um, for those specific categories of pollinators. Now, if you again decided that this is what you want to do, you know, and you just like, how can I help? Like, what actually can I do? It's very important for you to do your homework, to understand exactly what it is in your particular landscape that is a threat to pollinators. And the biggest one, like I said, is habitat loss. So these, this is a quote from the Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. And it basically is the definition of what they consider habitat loss. The main threats facing pollinators are habitat loss, degrade, degr degradation, and fragmentation. So as native vegetation is replaced by roadways, you know, through development, uh, you know, cutting down uh, woods and things like that for, you know, housing projects, you know, manicured lawns, crops, and even, you know, even big agriculture, uh, non-native gardens, and which means exotic plants, things that, again, that uh, native pollinators here are not familiar with, and they will not visit them so it's not a useful pollinator plant. They lose food, nesting sites that are absolutely necessary to their survival. And this is particularly detrimental to migratory pollinators who, because like I said, there are pollinator deserts, they may have to travel much greater distances to get from a food source to the next food source. So usually weaker individuals may die along their way in their journey. And this is specifically, you know, um, talking about the monarch is one of them. I and mean, there are a lot of migrate, uh, um, migratory pollinators, but that's a really good example is the monarch is because there's a lot of, they're very specific in what plant material they lay their eggs on. And if, because farmland and housing developments and things have taken that specific plant family away, they are really, really struggling in doing their migration, having their second, first, second, and third generations here before they go back to Mexico or to California or wherever they migrated up from. So it's very important that you be mindful when you're putting together your planting plan. Now, the Fish and Wildlife Service and pollinator.org have some really great planting plans. They list plants, and we'll, I'll show you some of the links as we go through. And uh, so you can see how specific they get. And then they even tell you where you can find these plants. Now, oftentimes it's not very easy to find them, but it is getting a little bit more easy in, in that a lot more nurseries, uh, native plant societies, botanical gardeners are understanding that homeowners are now thinking, hey, I wanna help. I wanna be able to get these plants. Can you help me? So they are starting to put together some really good lists of nurseries and places where you can get them, even mail order, which is, which is really fabulous. Uh, pesticides, just to reiterate that, um, you know, just the, Definition of pesticide. I mean, it's obviously meant to destroy a life form, okay? And by their very nature, you know, they do pose some risk uh, to humans and other animals, you know, like dogs and cats and things like that, even critters in, in the yard. So, 
For instance, if you have a mouse problem and you're setting out poison, well, that doesn't necessarily kill the mouse right away. He may be outside your house and get eaten by a snake or the snake might get eaten by an owl. So you're poisoning everybody along that food chain. So you just have to think of the bigger picture and just be very, very mindful of how you're using your pesticides and herbicides. And obviously read the directions because they really do tell you how to do that. Um, and then, at the bottom, I highlighted it in blue. It's important to use these, use these products only when necessary. And as a, an Extension Master Gardener, when we go through the program, we're taught about integrated pest management or IPM. And you'll see that a lot when you're doing your homework for pollinator planting plans and things like that. Basically what that means is you start at the bottom of how to assess whether you have a problem. And first is look at it. I mean, is it something, say you have a yellow spot in your lawn? Is it necessarily a, a pest, like as in, you know, army worms or white grubs or whatever? And you may not necessarily know because that yellow patch could be caused by five different things. It could be your neighbor's cat for crying out loud, you know, urinating on your lawn. So it, you know, you have to do your homework and understand and look to see if you actually do have a problem before you go ahead and start putting out your pesticides or herbicides. And then use the minimum amount required to be effective. And again, this will save you a lot of time and a lot of money because more is not better. It's usually not as effective. It actually undoes the benefit by adding too much. And then you can also add other problems to that as well. Um, so that you only use the, the application or you can do a targeted application. So for instance, if you have a large area and you seem to have a lot of um, issues with say fire ants and you may necessarily uh, do or have a service come in and do a broadcast you know, uh, application of a, pest, uh, a pesticide, that may not necessar necessarily be the best thing. Sometimes you can just target a mound and do mound treatments. And then this way, you're not actually broadcasting it where it could potentially bait or poison other native ants that are actually very beneficial. So that's basically the idea behind integrated pest management is understand one, do you even have a problem? Two, do you need to do anything about it if it's minor? Three, if you have a very healthy, well-balanced garden, you don't need to do hardly anything ever because there are natural predators out there that nine times out of 10 will take care of it and that you really won't have to do anything. So as I talked about, like what else could you do um, you know, and this is continued. And these are some really, really great links. And again, most of these are from the uh, Fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they have PDFs that you can download um, that actually explain in more detail what I just talked about as far as IPM. This one here is actually really cool. And I'm going to click on this link and show you um, the, oh, will it let me do that? Hang on, stop share. Uh, let me go back to here. Here we go. Can you guys see this? Let's see. Nope. Okay. Hold no, on. we just see everybody. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me let me it. see how I can get back to share. Screen share. There we go. Okay. Can you see that now? Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. Yes. So basically this is like step-by-step -step instructions um, on how to incorporate an IPM uh, program into your yard. Now that sounds very involved. It's really not, you know, and here it's like when implementing IPM, describe your pest problem. How many are there? You know, if it's if just a small amount, you probably don't have to do anything, et cetera, et cetera. So they do actually have a lot of information in here um, and point by point of what you can or can't do. And then obviously this isn't the only game in town, but this is a really good guide on how to put it into your home landscape. You know, I work on a certified organic farm, so we're very, very strict as to what we can and can't do as far as any um, pests, 
you know, crop pests and things like that. You know, we always are referring to how much pest pressure is there. So it's always that assessment. You know, you may not have to do anything. And this basically explains it for you. So I'm going to go back now if I can remember how to do this. All right, let's do that. Share. Okay, and we're back. So, you know, there's a lot of other um, lists in here and even the pollinator partnership, they have a lot of information about um, how to garden without using pesticides, you know, how to use the minimums and things like that. So it's just really, really helpful information. And it is one of the two biggest things that you can do if you are serious about doing a pollinator garden. So now you decided you're gonna help, right? So you need to be prepared. So we're going to talk about some of the frequently asked questions, you know, how they pollinate my plants, what insects are pollinators, you know, uh, some specifics about moths, butterflies, and skippers, and then why do my plants get eaten sometimes until there's nothing left but stems. That is probably the biggest thing that you will have to embrace. Because if you do decide to do a pollinator gardener for, a garden for any pollinators, and you incorporate plants that some of these butterflies, moths, or skippers use as a host plant, and we'll go over definitions of that, it will get eaten. So just understand that you cannot spray, you cannot, because you'll be killing and undoing exactly what you planted it for in the first place. So you really do need to embrace it. If you have zero tolerance for eaten plants, this is not for you. It's just not. So, you know, you may want to rethink it. Or when we talk about plant selection, there are some things you can do to, to minimize that. So we'll go over that in a little bit. So the pollination sensation is basically insects go from, from flower to flower and they're just doing their thing. They're just looking for food. Now, to put it in perspective, nectar that is produced by most flowers is like the sweet tea of the insect world. They are dying to get this, which is what prompts them to go and be so diligent about going from flower to flower to flower. And that's all they do all day long, every day until they die. I mean, this is their job. So as they're doing this, you know, they pick up uh, most of their bodies are hairy. They have all kinds of fine hairs on them and the pollen sticks to them, whether it be a butterfly, a bumblebee, a wasp, everything sticks to them and they carry it with them. Also, their vibrations from their wings, and this applies a lot of, a lot of times to hummingbirds or bats, but even larger bees, because their wings cause such an air turbulence around flowers as they're going from flower to flower to, to get to the nectar, a lot of plants who are actually pollinated by wind benefit from just the wind that's created from the pollinator as they go from plant to plant. So I just thought that was pretty amazing. Um, so understanding your types of pollinators, you know, it's not just honeybees and it's not just butterflies. There's a whole host of other guys out there that are doing a really, really big part of this pollination, unbeknownst to you, it's not just them. So there's butterflies, there's skippers, and there's moths, and we'll talk about the differences between them. Uh, flies, which uh, there's a lot of beneficial flies, there's ho hoverflies, um, and they're, uh, that come in different shapes and sizes. They oftentimes camouflage themselves to look like bees, uh, just to keep predators away from them, but they actually do a lot of pollinating. Uh, bees of all types, there's probably a dozen or so indigenous native bees here in the Piedmont uh, in, in North Carolina that actually do a larger job of pollinating things, even more so than the honeybee. So just keep that in mind. Wasps, they're actually really, really good insects to have in your yard because they do double duty. Not only do they pollinate, but they also predate. They eat a lot of other insects, and we'll get to that. Hummingbirds, of course, who doesn't love a hummingbird? When my coral honeysuckle is blooming and I see them flying around back there, I'm always like, oh my God, okay, I'm so excited. <laughs> and then bats, of course, you have to throw them in there because in certain parts of the country, um, not so much here, but like out west, uh, it, cactus and things like that, there are certain um, plants that are uh, pollinated by bats. So that's pretty interesting. 
So bees and wasps, very broad category. Again, there's a lot of different bees and a lot of different wasps. Um, and bees can actually be classified. And this was something that I, I actually did uh, as part of my presentation on Wixie a couple of weeks ago, um, that bees can be classified in two, two broad categories. And it's really by their mouth parts, like whether they have a long tongue versus a short tongue. And this becomes important when you start to think about what your planting plan is going to be. Um, long tongue bees are always, you know, obviously it's almost like a hummingbird, although their tongue isn't that long, but they are, they prefer longer tubular type flowers, where short tongue bees tend to like flowers that are very shallow or have, have a cluster of very small florets. So if you're looking to attract a specific type of pollinator, then when you're picking out your planting plan or thinking about what plants you're going to choose, think about the flower size and shape, and we'll, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Again, wasps are predatory. The adults feed on plant nectar, so they're great pollinators, but they also hunt other insects to feed their young. So if you're familiar with paper wasps or mud daubers or anybody like that, they hunt other insects and they pack those insects into their nesting sites to feed their larva. So you're actually getting the benefit of them doing two things for you. Not only are they keeping the insect population in check, but they're also doing pollinating as well. Now, of course, the caveat is if you're allergic to bees and wasps, you know, you're going to have to, again, be very wise because whether you like them to come to your plants or not, they will. It's just a fact of life. It's just going to happen. So perhaps this, you know, a pollinator garden may not necessarily be your thing. As far as butterflies, moths, and skippers. Now, there are three actual categories of um, those types of insects. And butterflies, you know, are typically daytime flyers. They have very slender bodies, beautiful bright colors, long thin antenna. And there's about 725 species here in North America uh, and 20,000 species worldwide. Now moths on the flip side, they're nighttime flowers, uh, flyers, and that's usually, there are some daytime flyers like uh, hummingbird moths and things like that. So they do fly during the day. Uh, they have very thick, fat, fuzzy bodies. They're usually duller in coloring, and that's not necessarily so, and I have some pictures to prove that. Um, they have short feathery antenna, which actually have a lot of pheromone receptors. And believe it or not, a lot of moths and, and some of the uh, moth families, when they become an adult and actually have their wings, a lot of them don't have mouth parts. So they don't eat anything. Their sole purpose is to mate lay eggs and then they die and they only only live usually for a very short period of time um some moths like in the silk moth family which are the largest moths that are uh indigenous to here in the united states especially the piedmont um the cecropia moth and the polyphemus moth they're the most beautiful moths and but they don't have any mouth parts and they only live for like five to seven days it's like such a shame so if you see one um snap a picture because it's so rare that you actually get to see them because they don't live for very long uh, there's about eleven thousand species of moths here in north america so they more than you know quadruple what uh, butterflies do during the day they do a lot more pollination that's going on at night uh, and they, you know, again, outnumber them big time worldwide, 150 to 250,000 species worldwide. Now, skippers are kind of a very small category of pollinator, somewhere in between. So they kind of look a little bit like a moth, but it's kind of like a butterfly and somewhere in between. Um, they're usually duller in color. They do have thick bodies that are nice and fuzzy. Uh, they have hooked antenna and there's only about 3,500 3, species uh, worldwide. And I think here in the Piedmont, we may have 50 species of skippers that are in, in uh, particular in our area, uh, but don't quote me on that. I don't remember the exact number. But the reason that I brought up the categories is because because of them being so different in shape, they 
prefer different types of flowers. So the fiery skipper on the left, he's just really cute. He looks like, look at his little face. He looks almost like a golden retriever, right? Like fuzzy and yellow and just, just, oh. and then, you know, then you have your typical butterflies, like the black swallowtail that's up at the top. And then this is the cecropia moth that I actually found its cocoon in the fall and it hatched out for me I, just a couple of uh, days ago and I was very excited to let it go. Um, that moth's wingspan is about eight inches. It's just huge. Um, and it is probably one of the most beautiful silk moths that we have here in the Piedmont. So if you see one of those, definitely snap a picture because it's just fabulous. Um, just in understanding the planting, and I said, you know, you do have to understand that if you plant um, for butterflies and moths in particular, you will wind up having some of your plants eaten. And they are not worms. Worms are a completely different category of animal. Um, even though a lot of moth and butterfly larvae are actually, their names actually have worm in them, like tomato hornworm, tobacco hornworm, inchworm, army worms, you know, cut worms. They're actually not worms at all. They're all moth larva. And so they um, tend to be very prominent, like you tend to see them a lot. And uh, where, you know, earthworms, obviously you don't because they're usually underground. Um, but just understand that they are insects and they are not worms. So any pesticides you put down that are targeting, you know, any kind of caterpillar or army worms, cutworms in your turf will kill butterfly and um, moth caterpillars as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, they are referred to as caterpillars, even though their names say worm. Um, and just be wary that some furry or spiny cat caterpillars can actually sting. So if you're not sure, don't pick it up. When in doubt, leave it alone. Um, and then they pupate. They usually are a caterpillar for anywhere, like the shortest time is maybe two to three weeks. Sometimes it'll be four, maybe five weeks. And then they pupate or go into their chrysalis and then they emerge as the adult. A lot of times, if it's a later generation in the say late latter part of the summer, or early fall, they will actually overwinter as in their pupa or their chrysalis. Um, and that's how I actually wound up hatching that um, cecropia moth because I found his cocoon in the fall and he overwintered and I was just very excited. It was a nice surprise. So, um, you know, when you're doing garden cleanup and we'll talk about that too, it's best to just be careful and leave a lot of areas undisturbed and we'll go through that. So here's some pictures of some caterpillars or worms. Um, the top one on the left is a tomato, uh, actually a tobacco hornworm. And I look this up because most people, nine times out of 10, do not have an actual tomato hornworm eating their tomato. It actually is a tobacco hornworm. And how you can tell is its little horn or tail that it has at the end. If it's red, it's tobacco. If it's blue, it's tomato. So there's how you can identify them. E either of them is equally as destructive to your tomato plants. And so if you don't want to obviously spray your tomato plants or anything like that, what you can do is because these are moth caterpillars, cover your tomato plants at night with say bird netting because the moth is very large. They can't get in to lay their eggs on the plant. And then you can, you can actually, the bees and things can come through the netting. So you can actually leave it on during the day because they're small enough to fit in there and pollinate. But these moths are so large, they won't be able to get in to lay their eggs on that. That's a really, I, I found it to work really, really well on my tomatoes out in the back. Um, the little snaky guy at the top, he's just really cool. And that is the um, spice bush caterpillar. They actually do have those paintings or little eye fake eye spots on the top of their head um, to make them look like they're a snake as opposed to a caterpillar just to um, camouflage themselves from birds or for other predators. Luna moth caterpillars. And then here's a saddleback caterpillar. And I can't take credit for this picture. It was Kathy Rushing. Um, and it was a fabulous picture of a saddleback. If you ever see this caterpillar, 
do not mess with it. It really does pack a punch. If it's sent numerous master gardeners that I know to the hospital because their hand just swelled up so badly. Um, so just be careful because their venom is pretty nasty. Okay, so holy plant, plants, Batman. So you're gonna wind up having plants because of the caterpillar onslaught. Uh, they're just gonna eat it. And you should not be discouraged because your plants will bounce back. They, they'll get chewed and specifically like a lot of herbs are most times uh, host plants for butterflies and in particular the black swallowtail. They love, they lay their eggs on everything in the carrot family. So carrots, uh, parsley, dill, fennel, bronze fennel. So they will lay their eggs on it and their caterpillars will chew it to the stems. Don't panic, don't panic. They always bounce back. And if you want, you can plant some for them and you can plant some for you. Again, the butterflies are large. You can just cover it with bird netting and the butterflies can't get in there to lay their eggs on it. So you still have your, your herbs to cut or use in your, in your cooking. So, you know, just be honored, you know, that they're coming and they actually are eating on your plants because that means they're happy and that you're giving them an environment that they feel comfortable or they have enough uh, plant material to lay their eggs on. So when you're attracting pollinators and you're thinking about your gardens, like what you have right now, evaluate what you already have in your landscape. And by that, I mean, just look at it at different times of the day when things are in bloom and see if anybody is visiting it. Are any bees going to the flowers on that particular shrub? Are they going to these roses? Are they not going to this particular cone flower? It's very possible that they may not because some cultivars of roses or you know, even echinacea or cone flowers have been bred so that for color or for scent or lack thereof, they may not produce nectar. So there may not be any insects visiting them. So just evaluate what you have at different times of the day and at different bloom times to see if it's even something that's beneficial. I'm currently pulling out all of my lorapedlums, because even though they bloom profusely at multiple times of the year, there is not a single insect that goes to those flowers, just so you know. Uh, plant diversity. So while you're evaluating what you already have in your landscape, also pay attention to what types of flowers they have when they bloom. You know, incorporate all types of flowers plant materials, trees, shrubs, perennials, and annuals. For annuals, always give a nice uh, quick punch of color and also a very quick nectar producing plant. Where perennials may take a lot longer to bloom, annuals, you can place them in between and have a much broader uh, bloom time. You know, try for four seasons of bloom. And I know that's difficult, but believe it or not, there are actually a lot of blooming shrubs that bloom in the winter time. You know, uh, winter jessamine, um, winter honeysuckle, camellias of, of uh, Sasanquis and japonicas bloom at different times during the fall and winter. So those are often things that you can incorporate into your landscape for any pollinators that may be either lingering early or perhaps maybe coming out of hibernation um soon you know late late lingerers and early you know um bloomers you know ones that are popping out of hibernation soon because we always get a warm spell and somebody always comes out of hibernation plant different flower shapes and sizes and again that appeals to different types of pollinators like the ones that we just went through like different size bees different size uh, skippers or butterflies or moths prefer different flower shapes and sizes because of their bodies. Uh, and they do tend to visit specific native plants. For instance, uh, the native passion flower vine, which is purple, or some folks may know it as maypops, they the flowers are so large and their stamens are way above the petals of the flower that only very, very large bees can actually get the pollen off the top and it's actually on their backs because they're big enough to hit that. Uh, where smaller uh, butterfl or butterflies or even flies or things like that won't actually necessarily pollinate them because they're just not big enough to get to carry that pollen around. 
When you're planting natives, choose wisely. Some of the natives can be very aggressive in a cultivated garden. Now notice I didn't say invasive because they're native, they're not exotic, so they're not invasive, but they can be aggressive. Sometimes they can even be quote weedy where they tend to reseed themselves very easily. They may spread very easily, especially if it's in a cultivated garden and not it's native you know, clay or hard pack you know, um, soil that it's used to. So do your homework and make sure that you choose your plants wisely. Once you decide what you're going to plant, you know, plant them in clusters. Uh, both pollinator.org and the Fish and Wildlife Service both recommend planting them in larger groups. Plant them in clusters for greater impact. Odd numbers to humans are more visually appealing. So if you're going to plant a, a specific plant, say an echinacea or a coneflower, plant them in groups of three or maybe five if you have a large area. But also leave space between them for them to grow because they will spread and they will increase in size. Create a wildlife habitat. Now, a lot of times when you do just that, and that is for uh, a lot of times you talk about it for birds and things like that, um, when you certify your backyard as, as a um, wildlife habitat, just giving these five um, things, food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable practices, which is what we talked about with, with pesticides and herbicide use, Doing those things for birds will also give you the same benefits for your pollinators because it's exact, it's basically the same thing. Any plants that you leave for seed heads and things like that to feed the birds are probably plants that pollinators are gonna wanna visit prior to them making seeds. So you, if you incorporate that plan, you're well on your way and it's very easy to do. And if you have the opportunity, leave certain areas of your garden, like a back corner or somewhere maybe behind a shed um, where it's natural or undisturbed. And what I mean by that is don't rake up every single leaf. I have a neighbor that is meticulous about picking up every single leaf out of her entire property. And she always wants to know why she has so many weeds back in her woods and why she doesn't have as many uh, pollinators and beneficial insects. And I'm like, well, you're not giving them anywhere to hibernate, to produce young, you know, to have a place to hide. You know, you're, you're getting rid of all of that with things that they need. So leave your leaves, you know, leave your leaf litter somewhere. And if you can, like a small wood pile or something like that, it's because rotten wood will also bring in great um, predators and food sources for other um, predatory insects and also provide nesting and um, hiding places for a lot of the butterflies, beneficials and um, things to roost and uh, also to hibernate over the winter. And I know I'm going pretty fast, but there's a lot of information here that I'm trying to cover. Okay, so if you plant it, they will come. So know what to plant. And again, if you want to garden specifically for butterflies and moths, you can do nectar plants and host plants. Now, if you do, you don't want to have to deal with the heartbreak of your plants getting eaten, try to avoid host plants. And a lot of the information that you um, will get from Pollinator Partnership and also Fish and Wildlife will actually tell you which plant is a host plant and which one is a nectar plant. So they actually divide them up for you. So you don't have to really do all that much homework. So if you avoid, avoid the host plants, you won't have that heartbreak um, as much. Uh, the nectar plants obviously is just the food source. The host plant is the food source for the um, for the young, for when they lay their eggs on it, so that the caterpillars can feed and grow. Some examples, um, just some ones that I've had some really good luck with in my uh, garden. Uh, some small multi-flowered, and I broke it down by flower size and shape. Uh, Lantana, budlia, or butterfly bush. Verbena, pentas, violets, violas, marigolds, crocosbia, all of those plants. Anything that has a small cluster of flowers, uh, things like that will tend to bring in pollinators that are smaller or that prefer that type of flower. 
larger flowered ones, zinnias, echinacea, and not necessarily flower size, but that they're wide open. So they're not small little clustered florets, but rather a big wide open flower. Um, passion flower, uh, clematis, hibiscus, my cats have just been making me crazy right now, <laughs> like go away. Um, Host plants, you know, again, vary by butterfly. Some butterflies and moths are very specific. You know, they need to have a specific plant that they lay their eggs on, otherwise they won't. So there's also lists on um, NC State's, and I'll give you those links in a minute, that actually break it down by which butterfly prefers what uh, host and also what nectar plant. Did you know that insects are driven by color, but they don't seem to say, see the same color spectrum as we do? Okay, because Pollinator Partnership actually has pollinator syndrome, and they actually give you the color of the plant and what the insect actually sees. It's pretty cool. So there's actually a chart. So when you go to choose your plants, you know, obviously you don't want to take yourself out of the equation. You want it to be visit visually appealing. You want to enjoy it. That's the whole point of you doing this, right? Like you want to help, but it wants, you want it to be pretty and you want it to, you know, have the best success that you, that you can. So plant what you like out of those lists. You know, remember all the same rules apply as far as where, how, and what plant to pick. Hardiness zones, what their water needs are, and what their light requirements are. So those things are still important. So regardless of, you know, what you pick, you still have to do the homework for that. You know, if you want to put a lantana in a heavily wooded area, you're not going to be very successful. So you need to put the right plant in the right place for you to have the biggest bang for your buck, the, the best flowers, the best um, draw for pollinators, et cetera. Old fashioned native plants, we kind of touched on this already, are usually the best choices because a lot of pollinators like butterflies and moths, even bees, have evolved with their native plant buddies. So a lot of times their body parts are adapted to particular flowers and vice versa. Plants will actually tailor themselves over time to accommodate just specific pollinators as well. So, um, you know, you do want to provide that variety again in different flower shape sizes and even color. And again, there's a whole chart of what colors um, insects actually see uh, versus our spectrum. Uh, and flower sizes, you know, bigger is not always necessarily better. Um, so you do want to give a variety of different shapes and sizes. Now, this is where we get into the good stuff. This is where you can look for plants to actually pick from that are the best options for a pollinator garden. So all of these resources are great places to go for information. Uh, the Pollinator Partnership has guides and those guides are broken down by areas of the country. They specifically have one and I'll open it in a minute for just the Southeast and it's all encompassing. It has everything you could possibly want in there. Um, there's also the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. She's got, that site is fabulous as far as um, if you're not sure, say you have a natural area in your back, like I do, like in my backyard, there were a lot of plants out there that I was like, I've never seen these before. And I was actually lucky that I went to the Lady Bird Johnson and I was able to identify a lot of them through the, the photographs that they have on, on their web website. And also the uh, North Carolina Native Native Plant Society as well was extremely helpful in that regard. They actually have a native plant nursery. So if you go right to their um, website, you can actually click on um, native plant nurseries here in North Carolina that you can either go to or mail order from. And the Fish and Wildlife Service at the bottom here, um, they actually have some really, really cool. I'm going to open up this one thing if again, if I can. Um, do this real quick. Okay, so let's go to share. Can you guys see that? Native plants for your backyard. So basically what they did was they broke it down and they not only give you the common name, which a lot of folks are more familiar with, but rest assured, that's not how you want to do your shopping. You want to get the scientific name 
And the reason being is because a lot of times the common names don't necessarily refer to this, they refer to many different types of plants the same way, and it may not necessarily be the one that's the best for your um, pollinator garden um, endeavors. So use the scientific names when you're shopping and trying to look for things online, because that will give you that plant specifically. So they break it down by shrubs, uh, trees, vines, wildflowers, and yes, even some grasses. Some grasses are actually very pretty when they bloom, like blue stem and little blue stem. They're just very, very cute. Um, so there's a lot of different, um, even muley grasses listed on here. So they have a ton of different um, plantings that you can use. And here is addition, additional information. They list Daniel Stowe um, Botanical Garden and a couple of other, you know, South Carolina Native Plant Society and a bunch of other uh, places that you can go to. And that's not the end all be all of the list. Um, Pollinator Partnership also has a lot more um, information as far as nurseries and things like that. They have a more encompassing list. And so does uh, ncwildflower.org. So let me go back to where I was. Okay, we want to do this. Andy, we've got about five more minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm almost done. Attracting bees with nesting boxes. And I know Ms. Beta had asked the question, and I actually did look up. If you look up this, um, website. It actually is a uh, fact sheet that tells you that if you want to use, she was interested in, in getting mason bee boxes and do they actually attract mason bees? Yes, they do. But you have to remember that each type of bee is very specific in the size of hole that they prefer. And this actually gives you guidelines by bee how big their hole needs to be. And then they also explain that they're, you know, how to keep it clean so that you're not propagating disease and other things like that. So yes, doing bee boxes actually helps. And uh, the picture in the lower right hand corner was actually um, Hawk did this we out in Squirrel see. Lake Park. Pardon? We can't see your slide, Annie. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not? Okay, hang on. Let me go back to. Hold on. What happened to my screen share uh, option here? It's not letting me screen share anymore. Why would that be? Um. Make your screen bigger. It let me go there, but it won't let me go back. Like it will not, like, you know, have the box at the bottom usually comes up that lets you do other things. It won't, it will not. Uh, hit the green, hit the green button at the, in the top left-hand corner. That's just it, it's not giving helps. me that. It's not giving me that all of a sudden. It just disappeared. Oh. Yeah, it won't let me go back. What the heck? All right, well. well maybe we'll have some questions. questions. <laughs> well, that, that kind of stinks because, all right. Uh, let me try this. Uh, nope, it's still not giving it to me. I don't know what happened. It just disappeared. It will not let me screen share anymore. Gone. Gone. Can you at least see me? Well, we did have a, a several questions if we want to try those. You want to do that? Sure. But that was it. It was just um, the link okay. for um, was through the Xerces Society for the mason bee boxes and the size of the bee holes and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, that was that was so, the end. Uh, on that point, um, and, and okay. <laughs> Well, about the the bee houses, uh, uh, Amy asks if there if some HOAs have covenants against bee houses, and even the you know the the bigger bee boxes, like if you're keeping honeybees, I'm guessing that some neighborhoods are not going to allow you to do that. You would need to check with your neighborhood, right? Probably. Mm -hmm. um, I can't see that Each if you're going to put like a, a bee box or something and hang it in your woods, you know that they're really gonna know. I can see having hives being an issue, but 
you know, I don't, um, I like don't a, see. Yeah, a, a big box. Yeah. A big hotel. Yeah. Um, you know, you, they yeah, come very, in all different shapes and sizes. You can put them in, you know, a, a cluster of bamboo and just stick them in a, in a snag of a tree or something like that. And they're, who's going to know? It's in your backyard. Yeah, exactly. So I thought this was a really interesting question. If pollinators drink from chlorinated or color treated pools, is that a problem for them? For not, the necessar not necessarily. It, I guess it depends on how high your chlorine content is. But we saw we see bees going through it's even honeybees all the time. Um, I would guess if it's their only water source it could probably be a problem so you may want to put bird baths out you know keep those clean and i probably have five different places that critters can drink from whether it be a fountain uh, i have three different types of bird baths i even have one on the ground um, so that bees can and put rocks in them so that this way the bees can get in there and not necessarily drown because they may not be able to reach it from the edges but I would do that. Point, I would do a point. bird boy um, bath okay. or give them natural water. Yeah, so give them a choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, she says that she uses, she uses vinegar in a spray bottle for weeds. Is this a problem? Yes, because vinegar will kill, every, it's an herbicide. I mean, in essence, you're, you're killing your weeds. So yes, it, it's a problem. Okay. So even though it's good, good, natural quickie. and it's edible, it's not, you know, it's going to be detrimental to, to whatever you're spraying it on and whoever's going to be eating it. Yeah. Okay. Are yellow jackets pollinators? I hope they have some purpose. <laughs> no, they, well, everything has a place, right? <laughs> um, it's difficult for me. To, it, it's difficult for me to embrace yellow jackets. They actually are, yeah. yes, they're actually predators and yes, they will pollinate, but they're just nasty. Do you know what I mean? Like they're just <laughs> nasty. Yes, so yeah. <laughs> if you have the opportunity, cause they nest in the ground. So if you happen to find a hive, um, you may want to get that taken care of because it can be really, really ugly fast. Trust me, I have some really horrific stories with with yellow jackets not my favorite yeah yeah me same here um okay so I, this is an excellent question too what about plants we consider weeds are there any good ones that pollinators like i mean we could have an entire discussion about what's a weed right just the definition <laughs> of yes so are yes. there any good weed that pollinators like yes actually and okay, a lot on. of times you know hen bit chickweed um, even the wilds, uh, I think it's blooming right now. It's yellow. I think it's a wild ranunculus, you know, all of those, um, there's also a wild, um, geranium that, that blooms. Yes. You know, it's, but everything has its place. I mean, if, if you will leave them in your garden and maybe not necessarily your lawn, you'll see that pollinators love them. I mean, even in the fall when the grass, like, uh, the, the Johnson grass blooms, bees pollinate that. They actually love it. So every weed, you know, if it's in your garden part portion and not your lawn, it's a wildflower. So I guess that's, you know, how you want to classify it then. Exactly, exactly. So anybody have any other questions? We, we definitely could go on and on about this. We got lots of comments that this is great information. And like I said, I will put um, all of the links. I, I'm sure Annie will help me with that. Get the, a link list for you all. And I'll send that out to everybody who was uh, registered for this class. That'll help a lot. I think. Yeah, I'll and just copy everybody those busy for months. Yeah, uh, yeah, you could. I mean, and again, that was just the tip of the iceberg. That's why I was trying to go so fast. Um, but I'll drop all those links into like a, a Word doc and I'll send it to you and then you can save it however you want. That's awesome. Thank you. And we will post this uh, probably by the end of the week. Oh, certainly by the end of the week on our YouTube channel. And so you can go back and look at it there when you need further references. 
And uh, again, thank you. And we'll see you next month to talk about all of these creatures. Maybe yellow jackets are included in his talk about coyotes, <laughs> yellow jackets, and deer or something. <laughs> all the things that you don't want in your yard. <laughs> thank you guys yeah. and have a great week. Thank, thank you, you very Amy. much. That was great.